and they flew me to Vegas and I became Diana Ross's opening act. I believe that each and every one of us has the power within ourselves to create the life that we really want. And I want to help give you the tools to make that happen. I'm Danica Patrick, and I'm Pretty Intense. Welcome to the Pretty Intense podcast. Today on the show, Howie Mandel. Let me just set the scene up for you. So I arrive, you know, 45 minutes early for his interview. I'm sitting on the couch and I'm thinking I'm going to take my notes that I've done um, while researching Howie and put them onto my, my, my blue note card that I always set down in front of me so that I can make sure I, you know, I have that there. Writing it helps me remember, but also then it's, it's a reference for if I want to make sure that there's a topic to dive into. Like, you know, there's just sometimes you end up getting into a conversation and you, and you forget to ask things. Like how many times have you been in a argument or in a good conversation. You're like, oh man, I should have asked that. And, and I don't want to do that with these, with these wonderful people that are giving me this, you know, hour, hour and a half of their time. I want to get it all in. So I make notes. And so I'm over on the couch and here he goes walking in and he's like, all right, we ready? And I'm like, oh God, I haven't written my notes onto the card yet. And I want to make sure I'm prepared. And he's like, you don't need those. Let's just get going. Let's just, and he keeps talking and I'm like, oh my gosh. So I just jot down like literally almost bullet points, much more, much, much, thinner amount of information than I normally do. And we sit down and we just go on and on. And, and, and really when I mean we, I mean he. Howie, Howie is a, uh, a full of energy, very positive, live in the now kind of guy. And in the show today, you're going to hear how powerful it can be to be more present and how detrimental it can be to try and plan your life. And I'm going to say it hit home because that's something I try and do all the time is plan my life. And uh, I'm not a, I'm not so much of a go with the flow person. So I found it extremely beneficial. And then of course, you're going to hear all the stories of how he's been, you know, wildly successful just going with the flow. So please enjoy. Gosh, Thanks for having fine. me on the podcast. Yeah, Thank you for doing it. Oh, my pleasure. You're my a, pleasure. I'm a fan. You're my first comedian. Just to talk to. Yeah. Okay. To talk I just to. wanted to make sure. I'm yeah, happily married. Clearing, clearing that up. I'm happily married. I've been married for 40 years now. And it, we're just talking. Because a lot What's, of people uh, are just listening to this. So they hear you say, you're my first comedian. And I don't want, <laughs> you know. Okay. That's, that's good. I'm right? glad. I just I'm want to. I'm, I'm a happily married. <laughs> but you're not flirting how, with how me. Are you are flirting you so- with me? How are, do you want me to turn this way? I mean, most people are going to listen. They won't even know, I guess, but if they're watching. Um, so how's your marriage going? Uh, <laughs> You're my first comedian, and how's your marriage going? This is starting pretty <laughs> awkwardly. My marriage is going good. That's my wife right there. My wife is on the podcast Hi, in the background. how are you? <laughs> she, you heard, she's flirting with me. Go ahead. Oh, she's after 40 years. That's how you've been married for 40 years? That's how, how she tell doesn't care. Tell me how care. you've been married for 40 years. No, you have to ask her. You know what she'll tell you? The truth of the matter is we've been married for 40 years. I'm still on the road all the time. Uh, the fact that I spend so much time away is what makes me so appealing. So it's like you've actually to been married for To not have years. me around is to love me. I would imagine people who aren't listening to this podcast right now are enjoying me more than the people who are listening to the podcast. <laughs> so says my wife. Oh, my God. Yeah. So I would say that with a lot of travel, it's like you've been married for maybe 10 or 20 years, not 40. I don't think we've spent 10 years together. No. I, no. 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 Got no. It. She tells so, me. Listen, more like I seven. Could, are you feeling the itch then? Uh, <laughs> if I do feel an, in, an itch, there's an ointment for that. <laughs> I do, I'm always concerned about itches and burning sensations. You know, I'm a germaphobe and I'm a hypochondriac. I do, I do. And that's why it's really hard for it to be, to spend any amount of time with me. I have trouble spending time with me. Do you think we can get an hour out of this, or should we try and think? I could of talk something slower. Else? But I'm you no. Go. You can. I'm very well. I'm. So do you think I'm medicated as we it's speak? That, um, do you think that it's the Canadian in you that makes you so funny, or is it? Um, well, I don't know that all I'm funny. of the contributing factors. Well, first of all, take somebody else to tell me. As many people, maybe more people think I'm not funny. You know, this was who I am. Um, and I've said this before. Everything I've ever been punished for, expelled for, gotten in trouble for is what I get paid for. This was considered a, uh, a behavioral problem as a child. And I've turned it, uh, luckily, it became a career. I don't know if you know that, but I, I, I don't have a GED. I, that's all I've got. Well, but it's a lot more than me. 
okay? I don't have a GED, I didn't go to college, I couldn't finish school, I was asked to leave school, and then as luck would have it, on a dare in the 70s, I got up on stage at a comedy club because I don't dance, I don't play sports, and uh, comedy became the rage in the middle of the 70s. Tell and me I went about this dare. Okay, so in the mid 70s, disco was big. So I told you, I don't dance. I didn't go. That's when Studio 54. I'm very oh, old. Yeah. I'm in my mid 60s now. So, uh, so I went to a comedy club. I'd never seen stand up comedy live. And they said from the stage, uh, the, the uh, host of the show said, you know, we also at midnight, we have amateurs can get up if you think you have the chops to do it. And somebody said to me, you should do it. And I went, okay. Because I don't ever. Uh, because of my mental health issues, I, I just am very impulsive and I never think of uh, ramifications. So I just said, okay, and I thought that would be the joke and I didn't prepare. And people who are listening at home should know that Danica does prepare. Yeah. I'm not used to do. seeing somebody do a homework. I saw you going over your questions, but I don't prepare. And I said, okay, I'll go on stage. I didn't write any material. And if you look at old YouTube um, tapes of me, you could tell I don't have material. And, and I thought the joke would be, and I never aspired to be in show business or to be an actor or to be a comedian. And they said, somebody said, ladies and gentlemen, Howie Mandel. And I thought that'll be the joke. And I walked out there and I thought, I did it. And then I look out into the audience and there's people waiting. I mean, it's, I didn't think that there'd be people there. Oh. And I didn't think, well, I didn't think. I don't think. I don't think about. You're I, very, you live in the present very well. I don't. Oh. That's why I'm medicated, but I do, but I, I'm also, I suffer from anxiety and, and we'll talk about that in a second. But I got, I got on stage and they were looking at me and I thought, oh my God, I, they're waiting for something. So I started, if you look at the tapes, I'm very frenetic, it's fear. And I started going, okay, 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 okay. Uh, all right, all right, listen to this, listen. And I had nothing, but they started giggling at my nervous tension of going, okay, and I go, what, what, what? And that was like my act was, what, okay, okay, we'll do this. And because I'm a germaphobe and I have all these things, I carry rubber gloves with me because I didn't want to touch. And this was years before Purell, years before access to, I didn't want to go into public restrooms. So I carry uh, rubber gloves and I just pulled it out and I went, okay, okay, okay. And I just pulled it on my head and I started breathing and went below my nose and the fingers were going up and down and the audience was roaring and it popped off my head. And the host came to me and said, you got to come back tomorrow. And I went, oh, okay. I don't know for what, but that became, that, that rubber glove on the, the hand. Rubber glove. I thought that was a stripper story. What? No? Is that not the stripper story? What's the stripper story? I have a stripper story? I thought you had a stripper story. No? What is my if stripper story? If you don't, story? you should make it up. It sounds fun. My dad owned a, like a club. Yeah, and that there was a stripper that you'd, you'd see a stripper every now and again as a kid, and yeah. the stripper was naked and like in a bathtub. Well, I know that. That's a different story. That's nothing to do with rubber gloves. Oh, well, you should tell I the like stripper your, story then. Well, it's not a, a story. It's oh. like a, my, my dad had a, a great sense of humor, so he had a club uh -huh. up in Canada, and it was, a it was in a hotel, so it was a bar, but sometimes there, he'd have this stripper called Princess Glow, I was like eight years old. If she was a 350 pound <laughs> naked woman in a giant um, champagne glass oh. who would soap herself up, then get out of the, the glass and walk around the room and drop her soapy breasts on bald men's head. <laughs> so, the, so what does that have to, but I don't know how to segue were, that I into. I thought that I, that was the story of the, of, the, of, the, of the rubber glove was that you, you used it as like a form of protection. You realized that that's kind of where it came from. No. No? No. But I carried the rubber. I don't know where my OCD and that, I was born with that, you know, and uh, as a kid, nobody called it a, a, you know, I was just this weird kid who didn't want to touch anything and would do anything not to touch. You saw this with your mom, right? And your grandma. Is that true? That's good. Yes. I think my, uh, you know, listen, I don't think you get OCD from looking, but maybe the trigger of cleanliness or being afraid to touch things with my hands. I actually know where that came from. That came from, I thought, and I've talked about that in the past, that they were neurotically clean. But that being said, um, through therapy, they traced it back. One time when I was a little kid, mm. I was sitting on the beach and I got bit by a sand fly. Do you know mm. this story? Uh, no. Okay, I got bit by a sand fly and I had these, it looked like mosquito bite bumps on yeah, me. Yeah, sure. And I, I, it was really itchy, so I scratched it. And when I scratched it, the bump would crawl away under my skin and it f freaked me out. Like, it probably freaks anybody out even to hear that story. Yeah. And then I went to a, uh, 
my mom took me to a, a doctor and apparently the sandfly had laid its larva, its eggs, in me and they were living all under my skin. So that's why, I, you know, and that's a traumatic story. Thanks for bringing that up, Danica. Yeah. This was going to be a lighthearted talk, and that was very traumatic for me. And they the show's took me, called Pretty Intense. It, it was pretty intense. Yeah. And I freaked out. I was like, I'm in a book for dermatology. They had never seen this beyond you cattle. You were the first oh, human. Wow. So they took me to a, a, a dermatology convention. I was like seven years old. Huh. They lied me on a table huh. in front of a, it was a, this is the first audience I ever played in front of. There was, <laughs> there was people internationally from all over the world, dermatologists sitting there, and this doctor explained what I had and how he was going to treat it. And the way he was going to treat it was he was going to burn them out with liquid nitrogen. Hmm. They didn't give me, I was a seven-year-old kid <laughs> oh my God. in my tidy whities bolted to a table with 500 people watching, and then he took out liquid nitrogen, and if you, liquid nitrogen is so cold it burns. Yeah. They didn't yep. give me yep. anesthetics, and he dropped it on the bump. You watched the bump would start boiling and... and, and Did it come out? Did your, did the, did Everything the, came out like that. I screamed. <laughs> I, I was being tortured because he dropped it on my skin. You watched my skin bubble and burn and blister and then open up and then whatever was in there would come out. I was screaming. My mom in the middle, like once it happened, went stop, stop. All these people were doing. She undid the the belt and carried me out in my tidy whities from oh, the place wow. to the car. We would never go back to the doctor. And then every night we would pick one of them and she would take a, a dry, uh, like almost like a sandpaperish kind of um, washcloth and rub my skin until it would break and bleed and then we would remove all the eggs and that was over a six month. So after that, I don't touch things. I'm, I'm, I'm neurotic, maybe I have uh, post-traumatic stress. I, don't, I have a lot of things and I am medicated. And, uh, but that, that was my childhood. So that's, and, and it's coming, it's, informed things I've done. So maybe because of that, I carried rubber gloves and then sure. the rubber glove became part of my act and the rubber sure. glove on the head bought me my first house. So you don't know, the darkest things in the world could end up being the brightest things in your life. You are present because you are flowing. Like, like those things, like that rubber glove, you just have it and then you put it on your head and you go along and look and this happens and then that happens and you've achieved so many things. But most people live so far in the future or live in the past and uh, I feel, I'm getting this feeling like you'd have no other way but to be right now. Well, I try to be. So the, 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 the problem is, you're exactly right. So the problem is that we all, see, I think the best human trait that we all have is instinct. Yeah. You know, and our instinct yeah. is right. And it really you're is. Right. And right. even when it's not right, it's the right thing that we should, we should be acting on our instinct. Mm -hmm. And even if it's not right, then there's a lesson in... Mm -hmm. that path not sure. taken. The truth of the matter is we all overthink, you know, and I live by what Nike says, just do it. And, mm -hmm. and that's everything that's happened good in my life are things that I had no thought, which could have been a problem, things I had no thought about, but I just said yes. I just say yes. Like stand-up. Like stand-up. Yes. Everything in my career, everything in my career. If you go through like, my career, but I, I always think we get in our own way and we overthink sure. it and we stop it. And I think everybody is as successful in doing what they're supposed to be doing and they're in control. I think they think, they being people, think that other people have stood in their way or right. they're waiting for other people to give them opportunities. Right. There's just Victim not- Victim mentality, yeah. blame game, excuses. You know, and I'm talking to somebody, you, right now. I mean, a, a young woman racing cars is mm -hmm. not the plan most people would have. Right. And it's probably being a, re a reason to not, even if that's your instinct, if you like driving fast and you have that skill, most people would think, yeah, but I'm a young lady. So I'm, right. I'm not gonna do that. And I would think, I'm not a comedian, I'm not in show business, I have no attachment to show business. I didn't even think of comedy as a career. And it happened. Did you, were you? F no. Did you use, good. You, I know Excellent. what you're gonna ask, was I funny? So the point being that I wasn't, I was outrageous. And I was outrageous mm -hmm. because um, I was impulsive, so I would do things. I'm not the class clown, you know? I was, I'll tell you, laughter was a big part of my home. You know, uh, my parents were always laughing and my, they have a great sense of humor. And uh, just, uh, I always felt that 
you know, I wanted to be near where people were laughing. Laughing feels good. It really yeah. is the best yeah. metaphor. But I wasn't in, you know, I'd go in and they'd be watching The Tonight Show and there'd be a comic on and I'd be, you know, five years old or six years old. I didn't understand what they were laughing at, you know, to hear the punchline. I don't even know what a mother-in-law is. And the guy's talking about a mother-in-law. I'm five <laughs> years old. The first time I was aware of what comedy was or my, what made me laugh, my parents were watching Candid Camera. Do you remember Candid Camera? Yeah. Do you know what that is? Oh, Al I watched Alan, it. Yeah. Alan Fund. And he explained to me, or I felt like he was talking to me because he was talking to the, and I'm sitting there with my parents, and he said, here's what I'm going to do. I'm setting up this fake office, and I'm going to act like the boss, and I'm hiring a receptionist, and I'm going to tell her she can't miss a phone call. I'm going for lunch. She's got to answer every phone and take a message. This is imperative. But here's the thing. Every time the phone rings and she goes to answer the phone, Look at this, I have a cable attached to the leg of the desk. It's going through this wall, we're on the other side. So when she reaches for the phone, I'm gonna pull the desk out and it's gonna go away and we're gonna see her react. I understood, it was like being part of a surprise party. I go, oh my God, I can't wait for this to happen. And, that, yeah. and I thought this was great. Me and my parents just started laughing, waiting. The phone rings, she goes to answer it. He pulls the cord, <laughs> the desk goes away and you see her jaw drop and everything. That was like a guttural, you know, moment of just laughter, which was relatable. Mm. She's a human being because you're laughing at her. You're laughing at, oh, would I believe, what would I do if I was in that position? I love that. Laughing at that human reaction. It's like those guys, those three guys that have that show, uh, Prankster, the something Prankster. Oh, no, 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 the, the, the friends. Uh, you're yeah, talking the about three buddies. Uh, uh, Impractical jokers. Impractical jokers, that's right. And how they, you know, they're they're like letting you in on the joke because they've got the IFB in their ear and they're like, tell her she needs to go to the bathroom. And like, it's something simple or something quite funny, but it's not appropriate for the situation. And you know it's coming, but it's the human reaction that's amazing. So it's funny because you talked about going onto the stage for the first time and the human reaction to something simple was, was the fun part for you, right? But I've become, in my old age, comfortable with discomfort. Discomfort is the most relatable. We all feel awkward. We mm. all feel like we don't belong. We all feel like we have that dream where you walk into a party and you're the only one in your underwear and everybody's looking at you. But that's life. You know, life, we're all competing to be accepted. Mm -hmm. You know, whether you get up in the morning and you, I would imagine, you're combing your hair. Why do you comb your hair? So other people, you don't feel like combing your hair. That's I don't right. have hair. I don't know why I'm talking about I'm parting it. I just can't it's decide example, where to. But, but what I'm saying is we live for others. We don't really live for ourselves. So... That position, I always, I was an outcast. I was the littlest kid in school. I can show you a picture, but pictures on podcasts don't work. But I was, you know, I just wanted to meet girls, but I was, you know, four foot ten in high school. You have to kiss them then and eventually. Waited. Were you okay with that? I have to what? Kiss them. My only problem is my hands. Oh, really? Yeah, Everything I, else is fine? Hand on hand. Hand on anything That's else it? is fine, yeah. I don't know why. Oh wait, hand on hand is the problem. Hand on hand on butt You're, is okay. I have three children. Hand on. <laughs> I've touched things. I've seen things. I've done things. So do you just wear gloves then? No. You need to use your hands for some things. No, hand on hand. I oh, just like true. after I do that. Okay. I don't shake your hand and go thank you. Yeah. Like I won't shake your hand, but I'll touch anything. I think I think we like had a slight quick embrace when you came in, right? I totally forgot that you didn't. I don't remember, but I would hug you. Okay. I would hug you. Oh yeah, because there it's she is. She's flirting hand... again. Well, oh, I think she's gosh. flirting again. Oh man. Oh but, man. So <laughs> now it's uncomfortable. You're uncomfortable, aren't you? No, I'm very confident. Um, okay. I didn't say you uh, my flirting confident. tactics are obvious. Um, so you would know. Um, and you're happily. You're happily. I'm not happily married. Uh, happily, uh, but I was, I'm happily I, dating. Happily dating. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Did he you would have a hard time with that because he has his hands on footballs. Right. So the hand situation might be a struggle. Hands in cars. I wear gloves all the time. I think I could have dealt with it. But let's let's talk about them. I mean, let's talk about that. I know mental illness is something that you know, like you've well, dealt you're saying with mental, it. But rather than mental illness, it's mental health. Okay. You know, and I say mental health should be equivalent to like your dental health. You know, it's yeah. really funny. It's very acceptable. No stigma. If yeah. you say, you know, I got to go or I have an overbite, they've given me. A, yeah, that's a, true. I mean, I know. do things for my mental health every day. I mean, but I wake people, up and take deep breaths and think of like a positive, like something, an intention for the day. Like that's part of my mental health. But that's a coping skill. Okay. So don't we all need a coping skill? Yeah. But we can't, you know, if you say my back hurts, 90 people will give you a card for the chiropractor. Mm -hmm. But if you go, I can't function today because I just don't, I'm just not functioning. And mentally, I'm just so depressed or I can't, I, I can't put, I can't put two minutes together. 
I got to go see a psychiatrist. I would imagine that most of the world, it's kind of frowned upon, you mm -hmm. know? And unless you have a, you know, I have a diagnosed disorder now, which I didn't get diagnosed until I was in my 40s, but uh, with OCD and depression, anxiety, but what about just life? Why, why did it take that long? Because I'm or old what? and there is a stigma from a kid that was born in the 50s and grew up in the 60s and 70s. There is a stigma to mm. mental illness. He's, even the word mental is... I think maybe it just could be a description as opposed to a problem. Like, I mean, just because you've done yes, great but it things wasn't. with it. It doesn't have to be a problem. It can just be part of who you are. It's not a problem. But everybody has obstacles and everybody yeah. stands in their own way and everybody needs a coping skill. Even getting married right, or well, becoming... What's yours? Well, I go get a lot of help. I'm, as we speak, I'm medicated. I'm always in therapy. I've put therapists... What happens if you weren't on medication? I don't think I could survive. What does that look like? Uh, deep, dark depression, and I don't, you know, uh, have you ever seen, like, Howard Hughes? You know, he ended up in the yeah. fetal position naked, peeing into bottles in his <laughs> room. But th mm -hmm. I, that's not far from where I could be mm. if I was able to even stay alive, you know? And I'm and all kidding aside, it's just really hard. Every waking moment is a battle, hmm. you know, and is, is, is hard to, uh, and, and I do it by... You talk about living in the moment, but I stay busy. I'm not good with downtime. I'm not good with the voices in my head. I'm not good. That's my coping skills. Yeah, that's so interesting to me because, the, you know, you talk to so many people and they're the way that, again, we're just different, but, you know, meditation, quieting down, you know, d you know, taking a nature, a walk in nature, um, quiet, silence, and that's how they reground and that's how they get back to neutral before they can go attack whatever it is that they need to, but that doesn't work at all for you? There's been times where I've used meditation and it has worked, but the truth of the matter is that the busier I am, the more focused I become, the better I become, the happier I become. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it's more about, uh, you know, and even if you're doing it with quiet time, you're distracting yourself from real life. Mm -hmm. That's a distraction. So they're all distractions. Mm -hmm. Quiet time is a distraction mm -hmm. as much as noisy time, mm -hmm. isn't it? Mm -hmm. I think that the You're difference focusing is, on nothing to, well, fo to get everything else away. That's a that's that's living in the moment. Yeah. That's a distraction. I think that there is an intuition. You talked about it, and so you can't hear that intuitive voice that uh, feel the the resonance in your body with um, a physical reaction that might be a gut reaction to something. And if you and if you constantly stimulate and go out and do do do, you don't get quiet enough to hear that voice, that intuition, those physical reactions to a thought and that it might not feel good. Um, so I, I think that you're instead of, so the meditation and the quiet part is meant to get you to a place where you can hear instead of be the one talking essentially. Okay, so I'm wrong. I'll do it a whole different way. You're welcome. That was the quiet time. You're right. No. You're right. I feel better. That was just a no. But I think everybody needs their own. Yeah, yeah. You know, that's and I, I said, like, meditation the way you are, has, it's just different. Me, medita but we're all different, yeah, and I we agree. have to all respect each other's um, tools. I think that a lot of people don't use their tools, or don't figure out, or aren't open to pivoting. Mm. You know, there are ways that things that have worked for me in the past that, you know, I may end up being just a, a meditator and none of this and can't and I'm open to th peeling everything away and doing whatever gets me through. What well, didn't work? I mean, other than that, not uh, trying to bury it, you know, trying to not say, um, you know, there's an issue and not. Uh, looking outside of myself to everybody else that was, you know, the reason I don't want to touch anything, the reason I feel a anxious is because everybody else is filthy and, and look at how, and I can't live, and I can't sit on that, and I can't touch that, and I won't eat that, and I won't, and it was like, uh, when I realized that, you know what, they don't have to live in my world, I have to live in theirs, you know, I'm not, this is not my world, it's everybody, and how do you cope with everything else that's going around you, you know, mm -hmm. it's like, the same way as your world, you know, my analogy would be like in your world, when you're racing, 
It's one thing if you're doing laps alone when there's other, how do you cope with other cars and other, you know, that's right. what life is. So you right. may have this great laid plan of how you're going to win this race, right. but you don't know everybody else's plan, mm. you know, and, and it right. changes, it changes you your, have to be ready to pivot. <laughs> you have to be ready to pivot, change direction. Things happen that are out of your control. How do you, how do you kind of live in the moment mm -hmm. or how do you, you know, and that's the problem with the world. The world has these plans. We have these images. We have these yeah. these dreams. You know, this is the dream. This moment, this second is the dream. And you've got to live this moment to I the fullest. I love that you said that. That is my problem. I am a forward thinker. I think way out and I have dreams. And I want to accomplish them. And so I push through and push through and force things. And I don't flow. And I don't live in the present enough at times. And I think of worst possible outcomes at well, times. Well, let me tell you something. As somebody much older than you, I'm telling you from the perspective of years and years and years in, into your future, here's what I realize, that this is what you have. Mm. This moment, this second right now, and anybody listening to this, this is the only real second there is because mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the past is your interpretation of what happened, but that's gone. And maybe it didn't happen that way. Because he ever, I, as a married couple, I could tell you, he said, she said. Perception. Every, everybody's perspective yeah. of anything that happened. So you're that's right. not real. It's just your perspective. That's not real. That's right. And your goal for the future or whatever you think your plan, it didn't happen yet. And it might not happen. That's right. Because something could stand in your way. So the only reality, if you want to really live in reality, is now. And if you focus on a goal or something you want to do, really what you're telling yourself, I find that to be a negative. You're telling yourself, well, that's what I want to achieve. I'm not there. Not this. Mm -hmm. I'm not there. Yeah. And why not make every moment the yeah. goal? And that's what I've always done, and that's what I try to so do. You've always and that's lived like that. No, that's what I've when struggled with. When did you finally arrive there? Because that's no, these that's are great deep. words. That's wonderful. Yeah, but this is what I. That's my battle each and, and every a moment. That's my battle. If I think for a second about germs, if I think for a second about my craziness and where my thoughts go and my rituals and whatever OCD throws my way, then I can be in the deepest, darkest hole mentally that I could possibly be in. So right now. I'm talking to you, and mm -hmm. I don't know what tomorrow brings. I don't know what, you know, I have no control over what happened yesterday. Mm -hmm. And my whole career has been like that. You know, I didn't plan this career. I had no idea that, you know, 40 years after that dare, I'd be sitting down talking to someone like you about <laughs> what I did 40 years ago. How long after that dare? How old were you when that happened? 23. Okay, so how long after that did you go, and I want to do that again? I never did, I, th none of it. So, so I finished the, the set and the owner came over to me and said, uh, Mark Breslin from Toronto, he owned a, a chain of clubs called Yuck Yucks. He said, why don't you come back tomorrow? And I went, okay, for what? He goes, no, you do it again. Went, I'll give you a spot. Really? I didn't even think that was anything. And then I went back and then it was fun and I got laughs. And it was the first time in my life that um, I, in that moment, because of that fear, you know, that's why I like, I love fast driving and I love uh, thrill rides and I love airplanes and I love that adrenaline. Mm. Ad nothing keeps you in the moment like mm. adrenaline. That's true. Adrenaline, you can't think of the past, you can't think of the future. So, I, 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 yeah, I'll show up again. And then I thought, as I told you earlier, I don't, I did not like or excel at sports yeah. and or music or anything like that. So this was a great club to go to, just like there are people who you know want to play poker twice a week and they get together with their buddies and they play poker or somebody who isn't a professional athlete who gets together at the Y and does one-on-one -on -one basketball. That's their, their escape, their release mm -hmm. for the moment. I thought, oh, I'll go to this club in downtown Toronto. You know, I was doing okay. I was in retail. I was doing okay in business. I was engaged to be married. Was this when you were working in the carpet industry? I was in the as carpet. Blind as a bland, a blind carpet man. Not blind, <laughs> yeah. color blind. Color blind, sorry. Yes, yes a blind you. carpet guy would color not <laughs> work as well. In this room color over blind. here, I said in this room over here, oh, I'm not in the house. <laughs> oh, but anyway, I, I, I color, it, blind. color blind, but that's okay. Yeah. But the, but the thing about it is that I thought, oh, this is a great place to hang out. When I went out here, uh, uh, I was playing at Yak Yaks three or four times a week, but no aspirations of saying this can be a career. Hmm. This can be a, this could be something. I have nobody. Hmm. I don't know anybody in show business. I have no connection to show business. I came out here on a vacation to L.A. 
here being LA. And because I had been on at Yuck Yucks, I had met some people that were legitimately trying to be comedians. And one of them was a guy by the name of Mike Binder. Do you know who Mike Binder is? <laughs> he, Mike Binder is a really, right now, really prolific writer, director. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the Upside of Anger, I think, was his movie. He did. He did The Upside of Anger. I think there was, she won an Academy Award for that. Mm. Uh, who who starred in that? Was it Joan Allen? Uh, I can't remember. But anyway, he he writes like Academy. He said, "I can get you on at the Comedy Store." And I went on to the Comedy Store. This is in 1978 or 79. One night it would be fun to do here in California while I'm on vacation doing all the touristy things that everybody was doing. And there happened to be a producer in the audience from the comedy game show, Make Me Laugh. And his name is George Foster. And I came off stage and he said, you interested in doing television? And I thought, oh, this is bullshit. This is so Hollywood. Yeah, yeah, I'm interested. He goes, come by tomorrow. And the first uh, studio, studio I ever went to was KTLA on the sunset. He invited, wow. me. he invited me over. He said, try to make her laugh. And he was pointing to his secretary. And I just, I went, okay, okay. And he goes, that's funny, that's funny, okay. Can you uh, tape tomorrow? And I go, yeah. And I knew nothing about television. And we taped five shows what? in one day because wow. it was stripped, you know. And this was a show, Make Me Laugh, which didn't air in Canada. And I flew home. How long was each segment that you had to do for each show? They so you had the, the show, Make Me Laugh, was you had one minute to 60 seconds to make a contestant laugh. And for every second they didn't laugh, they won money. So it's hard enough to make people laugh, but what, what was great... <laughs> they had an incentive to not laugh. Incentive to not laugh. Like, it isn't hard enough anyhow. So anyway, I did the show, and I was crazy, and I had voices and yeah. different things. And, and then I flew back, and I had a great story to tell about my, my uh, time down in California. That yeah. didn't air in Canada. You had video I, proof, it, too. It, but it aired here in, in California, or wherever, in the States. And I started getting calls. I got a call from the Mike Douglas show. Do you know what that is? No. You're too young. Uh, Merv Griffin. Okay. Do you know who he was? Yeah. So I got a call from, they were these daytime talk shows way before yeah. Ellen or Rosie. That, and I got calls. They said, we saw you make me laugh. Will you come and do the show? And I, I couldn't believe it. Again, I went, yeah, I'll come down and do the show. And I went and did those shows. I did the Merv Griffin show. But I would fly in and then fly back and do the show. But I did the Merv Griffin show. And I get a call from the Merv Griffin show, after the Merv Griffin show aired, from Gene Simmons of Kiss. Mm, oh, yeah, I know Gene. Yeah, well, I, did, I didn't. Yeah. But I knew what Kiss, who Kiss was. Yeah. And Gene Simmons calls and says, um, I saw you on Merv Griffin uh, yesterday afternoon. And oh, I go, oh my God, a guy from Kiss is phoning me. What's going will on? Will you be an, uh, an opening act? Have you ever been an opening act for my, will you be an opening act for my girlfriend? And I went, oh, oh, wow. oh okay, uh, I'll do that. Who, who's your girlfriend? I'm thinking, you're just asking me. Kind of Is it person a party goes, or <laughs> yeah, like a, what's an opening act for a girlfriend? But he goes, uh, he was living with at the time Diana Ross. Oh, I didn't know that. Huh. And I became and, and he flew me. She's in Vegas, and they flew me to Vegas, and I became Diana Ross's opening act. And it, the audience hated me. I was horrible. Like I mean, I had nothing. I had the rubber glove. I have pictures of myself on stage at Caesars. I'll tell you that, that huh. Caesar story. So I land, I land at Caesar's, yeah. you know, and uh, I go backstage at Caesar's Palace on the door. It's my name, Howie Mandel. Oh with, my gosh. With two L's. Oh. <laughs> but it didn't matter. You know, everybody knows my <laughs> okay, name. Is they not don't two pronounce L's. my name right till to, still to today. It's okay. But it's not two L's, it's six. Anybody who knows me, it's <laughs> six L's. I had my name shortened for show business. But, uh, and a guy comes and says, We need you to do 20 minutes tonight. And I said, Okay. He goes, Do you understand what I just said? I go, you said you need 20 minutes. He goes, do you understand what I'm saying? I go, 20 minutes. He goes, not 21, not 19. Oh, wow. That's what I thought. Oh, wow. <laughs> How do I do that? And now today I'm wearing a watch, but I didn't, I don't wear a watch. I'm only wearing this because it's got like a Fitbit on it. But I don't, I don't wear jewelry. I have not, no, no watches. And I go, how am I going to do that? I know what I'll do. So I gave some guy backstage 20 bucks. I would work in front of the curtain, and she had her whole orchestra behind the curtain. And the reason they wanted a 20 is because her show was perfectly timed. And at that time, it was more about mm -hmm. the um, um, getting out to the casino. So she did oh. an hour, and I did 20. Oh. So that's 80 minutes, and then boom, the people were not there. Caesar's Palace didn't care about yeah. people coming to see Diana Ross. They want the people to come see Diana Ross to and gamble. And lose all their money. To gamble, mm -hmm. right? And in fact, you are sitting in front of 
that booth right there is the center booth. From Caesars? Oh yeah, it is. Of Caesars, the original Caesars. What? They tore down that room to make the Colosseum, which they built for Celine Dion. Oh yeah. But the original yeah. Caesars Palace Circus that Maximus just came showroom. That to an end too. Yeah. That's it, amazing. That's the center that's booth. Cool. That's the booth that was in that room when I played that. <laughs> so anyway, I gave a guy 20 bucks and I said, okay, just when it's 19 minutes, bang on the, that doesn't sound like the floor, that's a table, but bang on the floor behind me, right behind the curtain, and I know in one minute I could yeah. take that glove out, I'll close with the glove yeah. over my head and blow oh, it up. Wow. So I, anyway, the first night starts. The, the, the lights go down, the audience roars, you can hear the announcement. Ladies and gentlemen, Caesars Palace is proud to present an evening of Diana Ross. <laughs> and the crowd goes out. crazy. And if you listen really closely, and I was probably the only one that did, you could hear, but first, Howie Mandel. You know? <laughs> and I walked out on the stage and just to a, uh, I'm sorry, I keep hitting the table, okay. uh, just to the sea of disappointment. You know, <laughs> this is not what they paid to come see, this is not what they want to do. And I only worked a lip of the stage and the people sitting on front in the front of the stage would I look down and they would be pounding on my toes on my shoe what? and I'd look at them and they'd go they'd mouth get the fuck off of the stage oh, get my the God. fuck out of it because they came to see they paid big money to see Diana Ross and I was this lowly comic that was just acting silly and going mm -hmm. okay what what and you could see I have a picture my wife took a picture of me on stage I'm wearing a sports jacket you could see the sweat stains through the sport I'm just you know then <laughs> finally after what seems like an eternity of silence you know uh, I, I hear boom 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 oh. on the floor behind me and I go oh my god that's Thank like the god. saving the best sound they've ever heard yeah. so I'm going to close with the, the glove and I take the glove and I inflate it over my head and it's still silent. You feel stupid when you're mm. saying things and nobody's reacting. Of course. Stand in front of a group of strangers, a couple thousand strangers with a rubber <laughs> glove on your head and it's just silence and I'm thinking, I just pray this is like double double uh, width latex. Maybe they're roaring. I'm sure they're yeah. all laughing and it pops off my head and it's just silence and people are looking at me and then that's finally I got to say, ladies and gentlemen, enjoy Diana Ross and they roar Lord. again and I turn around and I try to get through the curtain the, the guy is supposed to page the curtain for me, yeah. and he's holding it closed from the other side, and the applause is dying down, and it's more quiet and more <laughs> quiet and more quiet, and I can hear him going, D -d 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 what? Another 10. <gasps> Another 10. Oh my God. And I turn, that's what I, you're, those are the words from inside my own mind. And I turn around and the audience is just sitting there going, what's happening? And I have to do another 10. I have no more material. I am soaked. I blew up the rubber glove and I go, yeah, who's here from out of town? And, it's like, <laughs> and then finally I hear boom, boom, boom again. And I go, good night. And they let me through the curtain. Well, what had happened is I'd only done 10 minutes. I was dying. Somebody walked by. Somebody oh, walked by backstage. God. That wasn't a signal. I'd only done 10 minutes. Oh my God. And she wasn't ready to come out. Total truth, time goes this so slow and Total it's not slow going well. when you're suffering. <laughs> yeah. And the thing was that every night I went on, they hated me. Nobody enjoyed me, nobody saw me. One night, Sony rented out the whole room. There wasn't a person, Sony from Japan. Wow. The, the, there wasn't one person that Understood spoke. Understood you. No which was probably wow. the best audience they had, you know, because <laughs> they liked the glove. That's the one thing they loved. But every night, but Diana Ross would stand, there was one laugh. You know how they say if you can make one person laugh? Well, I didn't know this. She would laugh at the side. She would laugh. And then after a week, she, I get called into her dressing room, and I figure, oh, thank God, they're going to put this me out of my misery. <laughs> You're right? done, thank She's going to fire me. And she, <laughs> she sat me down. She goes, can I talk to you? And I go, yeah. Go, please, I'm ready. Please, just release me. <laughs> she goes... You are so funny. I love you. And I would like to offer you the whole rest of the run. <laughs> and then can every... I, can you pipe in some, uh, some, some people laughing a few times yeah, to make me no, feel better? Yeah, there was no... And every day I just... Were they it. laughing or were they not laughing? Were they laughing you couldn't hear them very well? No, they were not laughing. They were not laughing. I love you. you're the glass half full kind of girl. Sometimes. No, no but no. There, there was no laughter. There so, was no love. Like in and I your... did the whole run. I just went to her 75th birthday. That's me and her. I have a picture over there. I, she just invited me. I still have a, a place near and dear in my That's heart really for Diana cool. Ross. She was one of my first supporters. That's amazing. Well, in your field, you know, you, you get judged all the time, right? Are you funny? Are you not funny? What was that bit like? 
and you know you don't get the job or you get fired really quickly, whatever it may be. Um, although I haven't heard you getting fired, other than being not let to stay at school. Other than that, you seem to be no. Uh, brought but I'm in. aware of. But the what? But what's that like? I mean, that's. I think that's something that's a reality in life is being rejected and turned down. But we always, so, as comics, feel rejected, even when it's going well. So what do I'll you tell do? you why. Like, how do you deal with that? I don't. My wife has to deal with it. So the, the, this is the thing. One of the highlights of my career was in the 80s, uh, they booked me. I, I was selling out, but they booked me at Radio City Music Hall, and it sold out in Damn. like an hour or two. And then they said, can we put another show up for the same night? I said, yeah, and we sold out that. So we had two shows, Radio City Music Hall. I'm just this little kid from Toronto, you know, this goofball. And uh, we went and I did the first show and my wife and I go up in the dressing room and we're looking down on 7th Avenue. You know, I'm from Toronto, Canada, the suburbs. Never seen anything like this. 7,000 people are piling into the street, you know, on 7th Avenue and 7,000 people at the same time are coming mm. in for the next show. There's stanchions and cops mm -hmm. and they're directing traffic and the Midtown Manhattan is 15,000 right people. In uh, it's right in the middle of everything. Right in the middle of people are yeah. all there for Howie Mandel. And my wife looks over at me, because we're looking out the window, and she goes, isn't this amazing? And I go, well, yeah, maybe. And she goes, what do you, what do you, tell me what you're thinking. Mm. And this is what I was thinking, and I think it's kind of indicative of what a lot of, how a lot of comics think, is I thought, this is New York. There's 10 million people here. You know what that means? 9,885,000 people don't give a shit that I'm in this town. Uh -oh. They didn't show up, they didn't buy a ticket, they have no reason to like me, and we always focus on that, you know? Self-deprecation is always a win, right? So do you feel like some of that is just inherent in the, in the tone of comedy? Well, I think most people, whether you say it out loud or not, most people are not really that sure of themselves. Sure. You know what I mean? I, if, you, yeah. if you have to think about it, but I always, like, I, I tell a story about how, uh, you know, I was on stage and I was in this big concert and people are roaring and laughing and going crazy. Yeah. And I mean, I've just, and I see, I look down in the front row and there's one guy, one guy, not, no eye contact, nothing, and he's not laughing. And, you know, nobody else in the room notices that. Mm -hmm. But every comic will tell you, you start to play to the one Person. place that isn't giving yeah. you anything. Yeah. So... Uh, I find, and I don't know why I did this. I like, so I go, can I, hang on a second. Can we just stop this? The guy in the blue sweater, you're not looking at me. What the fuck is wrong with you? Everybody <laughs> else is roaring. What the fuck is wrong with you? You don't even look at me. And the lady be beside him goes, he's blind. <laughs> and oh my God, my heart just drops into my stomach. People and I'm repeating. <laughs> laugh at his what? Because I repeated, he's blind, like out loud, and everybody you could feel a full like oh, gut yeah, wrenching. Like, oh, oh shit! Oh my god! Yes, that's oh, oh shit! You couldn't have said shit. it better yourself. You did say it yourself, <laughs> but an audience did. And and I just and now I'm in a hole. I'm right. in a, like a dark, cavernous, <laughs> anti-comedy hole. And I don't know why it hit me, but I love these moments when I'm living in the moment. And I didn't know there was nothing I could say, but I did say. I'm not making fun of the fact that he's blind, but I do have a question. Why the fuck would you buy a blind man front row seats? <laughs> like, why does that make, put him in the balcony and lie to him and yeah. tell him these are front row seats. Why the fuck, and that's, yeah. I got the audience back, but <laughs> oh, that's what man. hit me naturally. Yeah. But that's, the, lucky moments and, you know, shit is thrown everybody's way and sometimes you create your own shit, but yeah. you gotta be able to pivot and get out of it in that moment. You gotta, it's you know. so impressive, the off-the-cuff. I mean, I, f I get the impression, like, you said that when you were performing for Diana, like, you, you know, the time was up and you thought, man, I don't have any more, any more con and like, any more jokes, any more, any more things to say, and then you had ten more minutes, but you also seem very off-the-cuff and very, uh, like, improv-like, where you just kind of let it go. How much, how much is... Well, like, is in my business now, in my business now, you call it off-the-cuff off and cuff, improvisation, yeah. And uh, you could also refer to the exact same thing as unprepared. <laughs> you know, that's what I am. I just don't like, that's why I was fascinated. For those do that don't know that are listening to this, you come at this because you've been asking me questions, you've done homework, you, you prepare, you were, and maybe that's because of your background. Maybe you had to, I don't know what goes into driving. You know, I'm, I'm the worst driver in the world. 
I'm the I don't worst. think it's driving. I think it's having been in the in being the one interviewed so many times that um, if they don't know anything about me and they ask questions that are clearly not deep or right even. Um, I had someone say that I went to college. I'm like, I didn't even finish high school, buddy. Um, but that's okay so, if they don't know about you. But did you prepare? Well, did you prepare for even what you did for sports? Did you see? I don't prepare. Less actually, less. Really? Um, I, I wasn't a big fan of like studying because you could get data from. So our, our our cars had an ECU on board with all kinds of sensors all over the car, and so it would know. You know, your I don't even know what an ECU steer, is. Uh, electrical. I don't know either. It's just called. It's an ECU. An ECU. It's basically okay, well, like the motherboard. I love that you're. Motherboard. Had the motherboard. You had all the analytics available to you yes, through an ECU. Yes, sensors on the car wow. into the ECU, the motherboard. And so you could get steering angles. Uh, you could get speed traces, throttle trace, brake trace. That's why I'm a bad driver. All I that never stuff. had any of that. Yeah, we I got to explain get it my wife. You. My we'll wife doesn't down. let me drive anymore. Oh, really? No. Wow. She won't let me buy any car. I like the cars. Well, you got a speedometer in there. That helps. No, but I like cars. See, I, ADHD is also a. I'm a, I think I'm the spokesperson for adult ADHD. I, mm. you know, I get distracted very easily. Mm, driving's and probably not your thing then. No, I took even flying lessons, and the guy told me to quit. This is not for me. I don't have the acumen. Yeah, to, that that wouldn't have been a. I feel like that. But I did. Like I, I like cars. I bought some nice cars. In yeah. my, I'm not name dropping, but I bought like one time I bought a, a Ferrari because yeah. I liked the Ferrari. Yeah. And um, here's the problem. You could take to a track. Just hmm? follow the lines. No, that wasn't my problem. So my problem was that, like, this is why she won't let me drive standard anymore. So I had a Ferrari, and then once I got home and I saw that I was at my house, I finished. And I got out of the car and I went in the house, and then I would hear her screaming. Oh, no. My wife, oh, no, that's kind of like that. And then Poor I look ocean. back, <laughs> and the car, I didn't put it in the park. I didn't put it in the, the, the car. I just get out. The engine was running. The, the, the oh gear shift was in neutral. And my wife would be rolling back out of the driveway, across the street, into the fence of the neighbor. And that happened like three times. She goes, finish. When you're driving, just finish. Wow. Just finish. She says the same thing when we're having sex, So how too. much, oh, well. But I don't forget with that. I don't forget with sex. <laughs> Driving like... and sex. Like you can have a sex drive. <laughs> and I am standard. <laughs> Where were... Standard. But she does the shifting. <laughs> See what I did there? You, that was a lot of linking up of great little sexual in, in, innuendos. That was it wonderful. is. Well, tonight we're going to try it with an ECU. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Do you have a standard? ICU, ECU. Oh. Uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> Um, gosh, that's 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 love a uh, fun distraction. Um, what, what sex speaking or? of, it actually makes me think of something that is like such so, such a I don't know. It's kind of like a shitty turn in the world where everybody takes everything so personally. You're talking you about political correctness. Yeah. Yeah, like They've you ruined can't comedy. say anything, you can't do anything, you can't no. make a joke, no. you can't not have an opinion. And in fact, like on social media, if you don't like talk about something horrible going on in the world, having no opinion is still having an opinion. Oh, and like really? there's just nothing you can do anymore that appeases, that is okay, generally. Well, so see, how does that affect you? Because like you guys get to go, I always said when I was younger, I'm like, I wish I could be a comedian because you would say anything you want then and it's all okay because it's in the name of comedy. Well, that used to be in the name of comedy. You used to say something, somebody get offended, and you go, I'm just joking. You can't. You can lose your whole, you know, especially somebody like me who's on, you know, family-friendly television. I'm on America's Got Talent right. or Deal or No Deal. Right. You know, I do, I still do stand-up, and, and, and uh, I tape my first special in 20 years, which is downloadable, and you, you guys can oh, find good. it. But the truth of the matter is, when I finally came out here and I made the move to come out here, my inspiration and uh, the the person that kind of uh, moved me the most was I watched Richard Pryor. Mm -hmm. And I watched Richard mm -hmm. Pryor each and every night get on stage and write live, uh, you're probably too young to remember, but he did, he did what I believe is one of the most seminal comedy uh, films ever. It's called Live from the Sunset Strip. In fact, it preceded, that's what Eddie Murphy, that was his mm. god for <laughs> Delirious and everybody who went on to do. And he was the first guy that I saw on stage at the comedy store, working his wares, and 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 do you do you remember Richard Pryor at all? Yeah, you know I, who yeah, he is. Mm -hmm. But his 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 tact was, you know, before that, you know, the only uh, the most respected African American comic was like Bill Cosby, mm -hmm. who kind of made up jokes about his brother and family and things like that. He 
Richard Pryor was the first one that said, you know what, that's so not me. And he grew up in a brothel and he's, he had uh, relationship problems and drug problems. And he used to talk about this on stage. And you, I don't know that you can put yourself in that position, but in the, in the 70s, the things that he was talking about and the people that he was depicting are jaw dropping. Like, and it was rough. And sometimes he'd, he'd find that line, cross that line. And you were in the room when he crossed that. He went, okay, all right, okay, back off of that. And I saw this is the art form. The art form huh. is to be brave and just to try it and, you know, put the uh, pedal to the metal, to put yeah. it in your terms. But, yeah. the, but the thing was, and, and, and then that's what allowed me to be like kind of very open and in the moment, not think about like, not. There's a freedom like, there. There was a freedom and went away. It went away uh, with the advent of cell phones. Mm. It went away when they could take a picture or uh, social media, as you call it. You know, media, when I started out, was journalists. It wasn't the guy yeah. who sits alone in his underpants on his bed tweeting. Right, but now no, that's uh, no history of knowing anything about the subject. Or context. Or, con or context. You know, uh, yeah. perception seems to be truth these days. Yeah. You know, whatever you... You know you're right. I am right. <laughs> I'm never wrong. That's what I... Will you tell my wife that I'm right? Yes, I will. Thank you. For, for, for flirting with you at the beginning, I'll cover that up. I'll help you in any way I can. <laughs> okay. but, but what I'm saying is people started tweeting things and, and saying they saw or they said things or out of context and then... Political correctness has taken away our freedom of speech, especially in the world of comedy. And even doing this podcast right now, I have thoughts that I would never have about watching what I say or how I'm, how I'm saying something could be perceived and taken out of context or interpreted in a way that could possibly lose me one of my jobs. It's, um... You know, like even now that you're br now that we brought it up and we're talking about it, even the fact that I jokingly said at the beginning, "Oh, you're flirting with me." This yeah, is guy, like, what right, are you doing? Well, you wouldn't right. do that if you had a male host. You wouldn't do that. Anything could be taken out of context, and it's just in fun, and it's just. But not everything's fun anymore, and they've taken the what? fun out I mean, of comedy. Why, what would a phone like? What's the what's the phone as a symbol, really? I mean, like it's that's the that's the delivery mechanism for seeing and hearing what's going on. But but it's is like it a really funhouse like, mirror. They just clip it. Do you think that's more of more of the problem because they can still see it? entirety and be like wow I can't believe you they still are offended Don't, even if they have context right People but you take still offended. so you take that context along with their uh, byline yeah you know whoever tweeted it their byline look at him making fun of ladies they've created the perception oh he's a misogynistic you know I wasn't yeah. making fun of even ladies. if you see it in totality they can still create the perception by saying can you believe he said this well the fact and then that people all, jump on all these lonely people at home it become they they're under the guise of media it's, it's social media but it's not really media but that's what we consume now yeah and that's how we make it's, decisions it's media now we maybe. get more um facts from social media than that's we right. do from newspapers or news well news yeah. isn't even news reports on stories not on facts yeah. news reports on you know what they said or you yeah. know how this is interpreted yeah it's not even when i was a kid i sound like an old man now but growing up and watching walter cronkite he gave me the facts yeah. and then i could just form my own opinion now you watch news they probably went out and got them themselves even right but now you watch <laughs> news and you're you're aware of what their opinion of what they're saying is which yeah. i think is kind of wrong from a news i just want just give me the facts mm. you give me the facts mm. and then i'll i'll have an opinion about those facts is but, there a solution for this yes what is what is it no i'm sure there is i don't know what it is <laughs> but you're right you're, it's a good question there is a i don't know i just think that we all have to be aware and concerned you know i have grandchildren now i'm, I'm so scared of uh, them growing up in this world that has social media mm -hmm. and they have access to so much and so much has access to them it's kind of a scarier world now mm -hmm. you know not only for comedy not only for broadcasting not only for it's just a real scary world but we have to be aware we have to live in the moment and if something happens we got to be able to pivot and people don't pivot you know people get we we love comfort and comfort is being stuck in our ways you know and you know this is every single day and every waking moment is uncomfortable for me and but I feel that that keeps that's why I'm alive I don't want to feel you know you want to go on a roller coaster you want to drive really fast if I went on a roller coaster and they said oh you're gonna love this the breeze goes through your hair and there's no real hills and there's no drops 
that would just be boring and it doesn't make you feel alive. But if you that first drop or that speed or your gut being thrown upside down, I need to just be in that moment. And the world is making it harder and harder mm -hmm. and harder mm -hmm. to take those chances and to take mm -hmm. those drops and to make those leaps. And whether those leaps and drops are done with words or comedy or an opinion. Mm. Do you think that it's your, you know, all of the things that you face on a daily basis that are challenging that put you in this mode of being more present and being able to pivot and not thinking ahead because it's just not your, you know, not worrying about that and not being, not almost being able to on some level. Do you think that that is maybe who you are today and with that great perspective and that ability to adapt and pivot? Or do you think that's just who you are without any... No, I'm, I'm cognizant of working it and pushing it and doing yeah. it because I don't think that's, I don't think that's where we lie. I don't think that's where we rest. That's not our resting place. In fact, when we met and we talked about it before, I saw you preparing. I said, no, 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 no. Let's just talk. Let's talk. Don't prepare. Don't. Mm -hmm. I don't want this time. I don't want to think. I don't want to worry about what you're going to ask me. I don't want to <laughs> think about what you're going to ask me. I just want to talk. And I, you know, that, that carries into everything that I do. I just mm -hmm. want to. I want to show up. You know, you met Rich, who works with me. He goes ahead, for, he produces all my shows, but he'll go ahead and say, listen, even if I'm going to do a radio interview, no, d just don't, let's, as soon as he's, just talk to him and start the interview. As soon as we get to the place, let's just do the show. Mm. I don't want to get scared. I don't want to get nervous. I just want to just be, I want that nervousness and that energy to be used for whatever it is that I'm doing. I don't want too much planning. Everything I've ever planned in life has not gone well. Anything I didn't plan ended me in a better place if I've gotten there on instinct. You know, I didn't plan to be a comedian. I didn't plan to act. You know, when I was a comedian, when I did have a plan, the plan was everybody at the time, Robin Williams and Billy Crystal and all these people were moving from stand-up comedy into sitcoms. So I decided to do a sitcom. And I went and had a general meeting at uh, MTM, which is Mary Tyler Moore's company. Mm -hmm. And that was the home of all sitcoms. It just so happens at the time they were launching their first dramas. <laughs> and they were shooting a drama. And they had been shooting for a week. They had 13 episodes to shoot and they didn't like the dailies. Every day they look at what they had filmed. They didn't like it and they decided to recast. Mm. So when I sat down at MTM, Molly Lapata said to me, can you act? I said, I don't know, but, you know, I think I'm funny and I think I can, you know, if you depict. She goes, read this. And I read these sides and it was just this dramatic piece. And she goes, that's very good. Come down the hall. And I went down the hall and I had to read the same thing for these guys. Didn't know who they were then, but it was Bruce Paltrow, Gwyneth's yep. father, and Mark Tinker. Grant Tinker was Mary Tyler Moore's husband. And I read that same thing again. They went, thank you. And I went home and my wife said to me, how was it? I go, I don't think it went well. They said, thank you, halfway through. And I don't care because it didn't seem that funny anyhow. And then I got a call, this is a Friday, you start Monday. Mm. I start on what? They go, you got the show. I go, what show? And I got the show called Saint Elsewhere. <laughs> and it, for six years, it was a drama. It's probably <laughs> before your time. Do you know what it was? No. Denzel Washington started on that show with oh. me. Me and Denzel yeah. started on that show. Wow. And it was a drama. <laughs> They did Hill Street Blues and St. Elsewhere, the first two dramas out of MTM. I did that show from 82 to 87, and I became a dramatic actor. And the guy I replaced was a guy by the name of David Pamer, who went on to win an Academy Award playing Billy Crystal's brother wow. in Mr. Saturday Night. Wow. So I didn't know. And yeah. then, to, to, to follow this storyline, my career kind of took off, and I was doing really yeah. well through the 80s through the beginning of the 90s and in the middle of the 90s, it really started to wane. I wasn't selling tickets anymore. I was sitting in casting offices mm. on folding chairs, uh, uh, auditioning for five lines. And I got a call from my manager saying, NBC wants you to do a game show. And I went, no fucking way. Mm. And you have to, if you put yourself back in the beginning of the 2000s, no comedian had done a game show since Groucho Marx, which is also before your time. Groucho Marx had a show called You Bet Your Life, but no comedian had done game shows. In fact, as a comedian, the game show host was the punchline. Mm. You know, I didn't want to be a game show. And they said, this is a huge show. It's all over the world. The last market is is uh, American. I go, no. And they go, why? I go, this will put a, my career is over. That's it. This will put this a nail in, it. this is, that's it. I will mm -hmm. not do this. They call me back an hour later. They said, can they just pitch you? And I said, no. 
And then they, he calls me back an hour later. He goes, he just wants to meet you. He'll go wherever you are. <laughs> you know, let them just explain the show to you. I went, okay, I'm in Jerry's Deli in the Valley. If he shows up here, and I'll show you after, I have the card. This guy, Rob Smith, shows up at Jerry's, moves my soup, and he had made a card. He, he didn't even go to Kinko's. It looks like a, an eight-year-old like had an after-school project. It's a cut-out <laughs> piece of paper. I still have it here. And he showed me deal or no deal. There's no questions. There's no skills. He's telling me there's 26 models. We're going to open cases for an hour. I mm. thought, this is fucking, this is not a game. Yeah. This is nothing. Mm. I go home, and I told you this, this kind of is a testament to how rough it is to live with me. My wife says, did you take the job? I go, no. She goes, take the fucking deal. <laughs> Just take the deal, go get out of the house. <laughs> so I was so scared. I t so I said, I phoned them back on, this is a Friday. Yeah. I phoned them back and I said, okay, I'll do it. And they went, thank God. I go, when does it tape? They go, Monday. Mm. I go, well, don't you have to build a set? They go, we have the set. Well, don't you have to hire models? We have the models. But how far down the list was I? How many people had said no? before I said I yes. think about that when they ask me something and it's last minute, they're like, hey, you know, can you come do this appearance next Wednesday or do this? I'm like, dude, who canceled? <laughs> it's always, so, so anyway, I said, can I hire writers? And I hired, they said, yeah. So I hired writers and I thought, okay, I'll be on NBC. They're gonna do five nights of prime time. They never did that before. I'll hire wow. writers. I thought of That's all this lot. funny comedy. I was gonna be witty. I was gonna be charming. I was gonna fall. I was gonna start selling tickets again. Mm. And I walked out. There's a picture right there that I'll, I'll show you after. That's Karen Van. That's the first episode, that lady with the case number 14. Up above. Up above. Yeah. And I walked out. And they went, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Deal or No Deal. This is Howie Mandel. And I looked at that lady as close as I'm standing to her, as yeah. close as I'm sitting to you. Yeah. And I looked in her eyes. I said, tell me about yourself. And she goes, you know, I'm a single mother. I have three children. I'd never owned a home. I don't have hospital. I don't have health insurance or anything. And then I realized, and you've now been on sets a lot. You know that people who aren't around television or maybe not around tracks or whatever, they get there. You could see that there's a, oh. a fog over somebody. Oh, yeah. They're not present. The opposite. They're just in a fog. And I was so yeah. afraid to distract her with the comedy because I saw the kids sitting there and this is a real person. Yeah. And I became a human, first and foremost, I am a human being, but I'm a father and I'm a yeah. husband. And I looked at her and I thought, if I distract you, because yeah. the first offer was like five grand, she went, no, no deal, and smashed at no deal. <laughs> and I'm thinking, $5,000, you live someplace in the middle you of the country. You don't have anything. You don't have anything. How could you just say that? You didn't even think, you didn't even give me, like, I wanna hear your thought process. <laughs> so I thought, I can't do comedy. And that kind of changed my cadence. So I, I threw huh. away all my comedy and I said, you know what? It doesn't matter. Life is much more important. Yeah. I just want you to leave in a better place than you came here with. Yeah. So I would say the offer is $25,000. The way you would talk to a five-year-old. Right. I want you to like, hear me. Understand the gravity of the situation here and what this could do for your life. <laughs> so then I ended up taping five shows, did no comedy. I was so... Um, beside myself. I thought I had just humiliated myself on national because TV. Because you thought you were supposed to do comedy since you're the No, comedian. I did nothing. It's the first time in my life I had not done a voice. You know, I do mm. cartoon voices. I had not done hmm. comedy. I had not done anything funny. I just wanted you to walk out of here in yeah. a better position. So I said to my wife, this is going to air next week. Let's get on a plane. We went way down south in the Caribbean where there was no TV. I just wanted to get away. I just couldn't take the onslaught of humiliation that was about to overcome me and I got a call on Tuesday morning after it aired and from that guy who showed up at Jerry's. He goes, you're not gonna believe this. This went through the roof. I go, what went through the roof? He goes, the show, it went through the roof. He calls me back on Tuesday. It's even higher. Wednesday, it's even higher. I flew back, I landed in Miami. The first person within 30 seconds just looked at me and went, deal or no deal? It was no the way. one time where I thought about it and I was gonna walk away. My wife saved me. Mm. It's the best decision. I've never had a bigger success in my life. That's why I have a, mm. uh, a, a production company. That, was, that brought, you know, I had very separate audiences. There were people that knew me as a stand-up with the glove on my head. Those weren't the same people that knew the character I was doing on, the people who were watching dramatic television on NBC. Sure, totally the show different. I did with the, yeah. uh, I had bets. They said, was Dr. Fiscus, I have a bet with my husband, is Dr. Fiscus the same as the goofball that puts the rubber glove on their head? You know, this was male at the time, so nobody knew I was that. Sure. I had a Saturday morning cartoon oh, wow. called Bobby's World, huh. but that was single mother, I mean single mother, that was just mothers sitting there with their kids. They didn't know that I was the voice. So that I had all these separate audiences, then Deal or No Deal brought them all together. So um, wow. I'd like to say, you're welcome, Steve Harvey. Mm -hmm. So, because after that, the next show that came on, Are You Smarter Than a Fifth Grader? They hired Jeff Foxworthy, then they hired Bob Saget, then they just started mm -hmm. hiring 
the fam family yeah. feud. Comedians before that, comedians that had didn't to do. Have felt amazing to not be your shtick, like not do, not play the role that you had been paid to play for so like so long. And while you're talking about like a, lots of different capacities, they're all about being comedian, right? No, not in St. Elsewhere, but the, but the truth of the matter was, was there was something incredibly validating about being accepted for just being a human being right. instead of being, being funny or being a really good do human. fake doctor mm -hmm. or being yeah. a, a funny voice, yeah. um, you know, the, the, the gizmo or, you know. We it, were laughing at the beginning because we were like going back and forth and I'm over there writing my notes down because, you know, you're a you're amazing and showed up early and here I am going, oh man, I'm not prepared now. And you're like, stop doing that. And I started asking a question. You're like, just sit down, just start asking me that. And what I was going to ask you um, was as a comedian, do you, do you always feel like you have to be funny? And my backstory is that um, when I drove Indy cars, um, uh, David Letterman was one of my owners. And I got that feeling like he, everywhere he went, he like felt like he always had to be funny. And is that the case? That's the, that's an exterior, that, that's, I feel like people, when they recognize you, um, expect you to be mm -hmm, funny. Mm -hmm. So uh, at this point in my life, I can't deliver that, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm not always funny. And it, again, that's when I talked about, we kind of, um, do everything in life for others. You know, mm -hmm. you comb your hair, you put on makeup, you dress because yeah. it's about others. You know, you're not showing up in the most comfortable. So when you have this persona, mm -hmm. um, they expect yeah. you to be funny. And that's a hard expectation. Do you feel that burden? I do. And I don't think I'm, yeah, I'm not funny. And I don't like jokes. I like awkward situations. If I can create an awkward situation and we're all awkward together, there's no I'd give you a joy. high five right now, but that's hand to hand, but you're gonna be like that. That's you, awkward. I like <laughs> But I'll give you the fist. Okay. There you go, there you go. We'll bump. But what I'm saying is people, but, and then sometimes you get in a predicament where you're not trying to be funny and they think you're being funny. Mm. Like mm -hmm. I've gone to a restaurant opening mm. and you know, I ordered the veal and then they put down the penne pasta and the owner comes over, Mr. Mandal, you like the pasta? I go, but I ordered, I ordered the veal. <laughs> oh, you comedians, <laughs> I get it. I go, no, I don't get it. It's not a joke. I really, no, I see okay. what he's doing. He's saying he ordered the, the veal and it's the pasta. I love what you're doing. <laughs> it's not a joke. I'm not joking. I'm just, so it's a hard, sometimes you want people to, know that you're serious yeah. and you don't get it. How did AGT come around? AGT was just an offer and I'll tell you, it was, you know, after I finished Deal or No Deal yeah. at NBC, um, my friend Jeff Gaspin, who was an executive there, said, how would you feel about judging? And I said, oh, okay. I didn't know what I was getting into. And I watch, I watch, I watch everything, everything. I'm fascinated by anybody who's willing to get in front of people and yeah. do whatever That's it is that you do. That's a show all about that. <laughs> yeah, so, so uh, I did it. I didn't realize, you know, I'd spent my entire being trying to be accepted. You know, you want people to like we, you. We all, I mean, all we of all us. do. We degree, all do. Sure. So the first time when I started on AGT, um, we used to travel the show. Now we're now we as judges are just in LA, but we used to try, so we'd be in Dallas, and we're going to see all the acts from Dallas, yeah. and then but you know you'd say somebody would sing, and even if they were bad, that was their hometown kid, you know, and I'd go, I didn't right. like that song, and then you'd have three thousand people in the theater booing you. I've never been in that kind of position. Did that you was ask hard. Simon Cowell how to deal with that? <laughs> he loves that. <laughs> he thrives in that mode. He thrives in that. But let me tell you a little bit about Simon. Simon thrives in that mode, but that's not who he is. Yeah. He is just incredibly honest. So he was a record executive that got a chance to do, and your producer yeah, gave him his first job and, and <laughs> sat with him and ate, we were talking before the show, before anybody even recognized him. But he was an A&R guy, he was a, a, a record producer. So you come in and when you would audition for a record, he, he was asked to do what he did. We never saw that on American television where somebody's just honest. He created the whole genre, I think, of these judging and talent shows of the way they are, instead of just being nutty if they were if they were not that then it was the gong show yeah. where they were supposed to be bad yeah. but he's the one that was honest and what they didn't show and i don't know if they showed it on they didn't show it on idol but and they didn't really show it on our shows too much is if he's honest and we feel that somebody's feelings got hurt as soon as they go to commercial he's the first one to jump on the page on the mm. stage give them a hug and tell them mm. and, and be you know, uh, constructive hmm. and comfort them. And so he cares about kids, he cares about animals. Hmm. He has a heart, hmm. but that 
honesty, that brutal the honesty. Truth is just in him. He can't. He can't lie. And truth is. Truth you know, hurts sometimes. It does. You know, I mean, I would say that in my life, like, I am a truth seeker, no matter how much it hurts, or no matter how, and, but you know what, no, it always. No, is that true? Yeah. Is that true, really? It's true, it's so true. So if you said to Aaron, do, do these pants make my butt look big? Yeah. Do you want the like, truth? Yeah, I do. No, you don't. I do. No, you don't. I, I do, I, I really no, do. No, you don't. Yeah. You're lying. I think you're lying. All right, you're right. No, I'm not. I really am. I really would want to know. I want the you truth. You think in you want to know until you hear the truth. I don't think you want to know that. He'll say you look beautiful. Let's go. I'm just hoping his perception is is that no matter what, I look beautiful. And I that, thought you wanted the truth. I thought. You, I wish. Not, I just no hope. Matter I what. just hope that's his truth. No, <laughs> it's not. I would imagine you're very Did you beautiful, say I have young a big man. Butt? No, and even if you do, I'm not looking at your butt because you're sitting on it. But even if you do, there's there's beauty in that. I think the Kardashians have created an entire industry. Yeah, that, yeah, mm, ah, mm, yeah. As, yep. They're right. Not proportionate. Something Pardon me? weird there. Their butts are that's, way too big. That's your taste. Mm, that's true. That's I my don't perception. Think so. so you like big butts? I and do. And you cannot lie. Write that down. Write that down. <laughs> that you should write down. That could be a song or something. No, I'm serious. I'm telling you. I don't know that oh, much about man. music, but I'm telling you that could be a hit. You know, um, speaking of, because I feel like there, that kind of leads into so much of like a, a fake world of like what's really important and what do we really want in life. And, you know, you're 63, right? Yeah. <clears throat> what do you want now? Like what's important to you now? Um, well, my children... Maybe, my maybe what's different. Like, what's different now that, that used to be important to you that's not, and you've realized, you know what? I'm 63. I finally realized this. Well, the, just, you've got to be comfortable with yourself and respect. Uh, I, just the one word that I feel that we don't have enough of in this world is respect. Mm. You know, and I try to teach as a parent my kids to respect everybody, everything... The, just we don't have respect. We just don't respect. If somebody is different than you, thinks different than you, are different than you, come from a different place, there seems to be a disrespect. Like your way is right and uh, my way is right and you're a piece of shit. An immediate judgment. Yeah, and, and even judging, and I'm, I'm saying this as I'm a judge. A judge. <laughs> but, but even if I don't love what you're doing or what you stand for, I respect you. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, I have nothing over anybody else or anything else. Mm -hmm. I just think that we lack respect in this world. And social media is kind of the adrenaline for disrespect because I think that people can be incredibly disrespectful and hurtful in the anonymity of their own room and behind their own thumbs and they say hurtful, you know, and it, even you and I being on television or being in a podcast, it's really funny how they, you know, my mom used to teach me if you, uh, if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. There's no reason for that. But I think because you're on TV or they know you, you know, somebody will come up to you and say things, you know, I used to like, you had thick curly hair. I don't like the bald, why did you shave? Like, why are you saying that Treat to me? Treat you like you're not a human. Yeah, like or you look just, fatter in person. You live in the box. You live fatter in person. But even if, even if I'm just a guy from television, who tells another person yeah. you look fatter in person? Is that good? Is that, why are, I like well, when they tell me you're so much smaller in person. I'm like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, thanks. Yeah, so what are you saying? Because it's right. And you say, no, I'm not. <gasps> I'm not smaller in person. I'm the, exactly the same size wherever I go. Yeah. And what is your point? Yeah. <laughs> you know? Well, and you should say, and you are, I'm going to be honest, and I don't take this badly, but you are uglier in person. <laughs> say that to the person that says it to you. And then they get mad. How could you say that? How could you say? But being small is not a bad thing. You, you, you don't care about your height, do you? No. 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 I take it in the personal way of like, you're a lot thinner in person. <laughs> is, that, do, is that a bad That's thing a to say? That's a female insecurity. What? Oh, you always want to be skinny, right? Like, oh, you said like, it didn't bother you if yeah. you said the pants make your butt look big. Ha. Oh, my God. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the circle of life and the circle it, of Danica's pants, apparently. You know what? You are always right. Thank you, and I do respect you. And Even I respect more you. Now. I'm such a big fan. Thank you. You're wonderful. I like people who do things that are out of the box, and you are certainly the epitome mm. of out of the box. Don't judge a book Thanks. by its cover. If people Thanks. didn't know you and they looked at you, they would never guess 
what you did for a living, not only what you did for a living, what you excelled at for a mm. living. And now, I, I'll be honest with you, you're excelling at this. Mm. This is really good. This was a, I do a lot of these. You're really wonderful. I wish you much success and Thank many, you. many years. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you.